Nature Revisited, the podcast. And thank you for joining us for this episode with Kristen Olson, entitled Sweet in Tooth and Claw. Nature Revisited is proud to have Kissed the Ground as the sponsor for this edition. Hi, everyone. My name is Finian Makepeace. I'm the co-founder of Kiss the Ground, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to awakening people to the possibilities of regeneration. We are thrilled to sponsor this edition of Nature Revisited, featuring our friend Kristen Olson, author of The Soil Will Save Us and recently released Sweet in Tooth and Claw. When we learned about the incredible opportunity of soil health and regenerative agriculture nearly 10 years ago, Kristen's book was one of our main staples, and we were so pleased to have met her and then worked alongside her to help this movement grow. Kiss the Ground inspires participation in this movement through media, communication, education, workshops, immersive programming, and advocacy. And you can participate directly with us through our latest advocacy effort, Regenerate America, an unprecedented grassroots campaign created to ensure support for regenerative agriculture in the 2023 Farm Bill and beyond. Regenerate America is designed to unite individuals, farmers, ranchers, businesses, and nonprofits and companies around the idea that soil is our common ground and that our future is dependent on the actions we take today. With new excitement for soil health on both sides of the aisle, now is the time to build political will to create change in our food system. Together, we can do this. If you believe in healthy, abundant future for yourself, your family, your community, visit regenerateamerica.com. And again, Kiss the Ground is honored to be sponsoring today's podcast with our friend Kristen Olson. Kristen Olson is a freelance journalist, essayist, and the author of the best selling book, The Soil Will Save Us. Kristen joins me today from her home in Portland, Oregon. Hello, Kristen. Hello, Stefan. Thank you for joining me on Nature Revisited to talk about your new book, Sweet in Tooth and Claw. Stories of Generosity and Cooperation in the Natural World. But first, let's look back just a bit. Growing up, just how important was nature and the natural world to you? Well, I wish I could say that I came from a family where the kids go camping and hiking and canoeing and all that. But no, I did not grow up in that kind of family. My parents were not camping, hiking, kayaking people. They were golfing and bridge playing people. And they liked having parties and singing around the piano. But they did love to grow things, whether that was beautiful flowers or vegetables. And, you know, growing things is part of one of the beautiful relationships that we have with the rest of nature. But I honestly think that one of the things that was really drew me to the natural world was that I spent a lot of time alone. I had four siblings. And my mother was ill for a lot of my childhood years. So I spent a lot of time outside sort of talking to trees and watching things skitter around in ponds. And and I used to spend a lot of time in a vacant lot near our house that had hundreds of ant nests. So I used to love to just sort of sit out there and watch them work and put little obstructions in their paths to see how they moved things and put little piles of sugar and other treats out for them. It's not camping and hiking and kayaking, but it, I think it mattered to me. So when did you first discover you wanted to pursue a career as a writer? And was nature a factor in what you wanted to write about? No, I never really thought much about being a writer when I was young, but I was a tremendous reader. And my parents were big readers, and they always made sure I had plenty of books. So there were a lot of books about nature that I read over and over again and loved. It never occurred to me that I could be a writer myself until I got to college, which was a small women's college. And I showed up at the campus newspaper office and I told them that I wanted to write articles. So the editor of this college newspaper asked me to go to a nearby men's college where William Shockley, you know, the infamous eugenicist, 
was going to be speaking. So the crowd booed so much that he couldn't speak. And I went back to school and wrote a very long article when she had asked for a very short one. But she thought it was great and told me uh, she thought I should have her job the following year. And I'd sort of been writing ever since. So when did you first start to formulate your ideas for this book? It was probably has to do with my last book, The Soil Will Save Us. Uh, Probably what excited me the most about that book was the realization that plants are not just takers. You know, there was this claim that purveyors of fertilizer and other chemicals from industrial agriculture, that you have to keep dumping a lot of chemical fertilizer on plants because they just suck everything out of the soil, the water and all the nutrients and all that. So when I wrote The Soil Will Save Us, it was really exciting for me to learn that that really wasn't true, that plants are engaged in an ongoing partnership and dialogue with the communities of microorganisms living in the soil and that they are sharing the carbon fuel that they make during photosynthesis with these other living things in exchange for nutrients and water and chemical messages. In fact, there's so much back and forth between plants and those soil microorganisms that we'll probably never figure it all out. I mean, it's just that complex. And I wanted to build upon that idea of the partnership in nature. And when I heard the Canadian forest ecologist Suzanne Samard talk at a conference about the incredible sharing and connection that goes on between trees and fungi in the forest, I became convinced that I wanted to look for more of that kind of science and that kind of story. I love the title, Sweet in Tooth and Claw. Why did you choose that? Well, you know, it just sort of popped into my head, and I liked it. With this book, I really wanted to push against the metaphors and ingrained ways of thinking that most of us have about nature, that it's all about competitiveness and combat and violence. And those metaphors, those ideas that we have about nature extend to us, too, of course, because we're part of nature. And I thought of that line, nature, read in tooth and claw from Alfred Lord Tennyson's poem, which was uh, him grieving the death of one of his friends. So that line jumped out of that poem about 175 years ago and joined with other ideas that were in circulation to, um, to characterize the natural world as one of violent combat. And I really wanted to push back against that. So the subtitle of the book is Stories of Generosity and Corporation in the Natural World. How did you start to collect these stories? Well, looking back through my emails, I see that I fired a lot of arrows, queries to scientists about research or queries to activists or land managers about things that they were doing on the ground and only a few hit targets. I think part of the problem was that a lot of the scientists didn't really talk about their work using the language I was using. Part of the problem was there wasn't a lot of the kind of research that I was looking for. Sort of part of the problem from my perspective is that there isn't enough research that tries to understand the rest of nature and then transmits that understanding to humans so that we can change our behavior and allow the world to thrive. You know, I'm always sort of bemused when I see people wearing those T-shirts or posting signs that say, we believe in science or trust science. And I always kind of think, which science? What questions are they asking and who's funding it? So much of what passes as science is all about product development or trying to hack the rest of nature because of the misguided notion that doing so might make life better for humans. It does make life better in a certain limited sense for the human selling the products or starting a hot new venture, but it does not necessarily make life better. Can you describe and define for us who are not completely familiar with the term, what is mutualism and why is it so important? Well, a mutualism is the mutually beneficial relationship between two or more different species. And the one that most people are familiar with, and one would hope, sees every day is the mutualism between bees and plants, in which bees visit plants to collect nectar and some pollen, and in the process get dusted with pollen, which they then carry off to other plants. In a mutualism like this, both partners benefit. 
the bees get nectar and a little pollen, and the plants get help with reproduction. And there's probably dozens of other ways that they benefit too. So just about every living thing in an ecosystem has at least one mutualistic relationship and probably many more. You know, we human beings in the ecosystem of us have many mutualistic relationships with the 35 trillion bacteria that live in us and on us, as well as the other living things, the viruses and the fungi and the protozoa and the yeasts that live in us and on us. So mutualisms are everywhere. I mean, everywhere we look. And they're responsible, they're responsible for everything on the planet everything that's living on the planet working well, from the fertility of the soil to the health of our coral reefs. I think my favorite mutualism that I learned about while writing this book is a three-way mutualism among a plant, a fungus, and a virus in Yellowstone National Park. So scientists found that these plants could live near the geysers and the hot vents inside the park. It's a very hot landscape. But only if the plants had a relationship with a fungus that was infected with that virus. Your book consists of eight stories or essays that kind of illustrate this mutualism. I'm going to limit it to four. So let's start with chapter two, and it was called We Need Better Metaphors. What do you mean by that? Humans tell stories. Individually, we have narratives about our history and our families and our work and our path in life. And those not only feel meaningful and help define us to ourselves and others, but they also guide us forward. And societies and cultures also have stories that define us and guide us. And from all these stories, there are metaphors and aphorisms that sort of clang around in our heads and have a lot of power pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, and only the strong survive. And of course, survival of the fittest, which went from being an idea in philosophy and science to an idea in the early 20th century that was applied to social relations and people. So I became interested in how the metaphors in our culture shape our actions and ideas when I discovered the scientist Doug Boucher's book, which is called The Biology of Mutualism, which was published back in the 1980s. And I was struck by something he said at the very beginning of the book, which was that mutualism was having a renaissance in scientific thought after falling out of favor. And I thought, wait, if it had a renaissance back in the 1980s, what happened to it? So I started to wonder how our culture and our science influence each other that not only does the culture shape much of the direction of science, and, and not just because of the ideas floating around the culture, but also very specifically about what science is funded and what questions we expect it to ask, but also about how ideas from science shape the culture. And as I got into this, it seemed to me that with mutualism and the whole idea of cooperation, science has new ideas and the culture is open to them, and that that's a real opportunity to change things for the better. So you also give us a, a little bit of a history lesson in that chapter. Uh, you go back to the time of Darwin and his theories on evolution, and you talk about the Russian anarchist, Peter Kropotkin. Can you share with us why he was so important in the 1800s, and why, though he's still hardly remembered today, why he is still important. Yeah, he's uh, he's such an interesting guy. And by the way, his many of his books are still in print. So that's something that you can't say for many authors. So Kropotkin was not only a major scientist of, of his time. You know, he was uh, a scientist who traveled the world and gave speeches that drew thousands of people. And I originally got interested in him because Kropotkin was a leading voice talking about cooperation in nature and mutual aid in nature. And But he was an anarchist, and that spooked a lot of people. So he had been born a member of the Russian aristocracy who basically trashed that life for leftist politics and science. And instead of using his birthright for advantage or an exalted position with the czar, he instead opted to join a kind of obscure branch of the military at 19 that would allow him to travel Russia for five years 
doing scientific observations and following up on Darwin's work. So he was a huge fan of Darwin, but when he went out doing his scientific observations, he was expecting to see all this fighting and competition, but instead he saw mutual aid. He saw animals helping each other find shelter and food, enjoying each other's company. He wrote a book called Mutual Aid, and that was written as a rebuttal to one of Darwin's other supporters who had really taken the idea of competition to extremes. So when I started reading the next chapter, We Are Ecosystems, I couldn't help but think you certainly confirmed we are nature, and it goes right to our guts. So how are we truly nature? Well, I think it's always really important to remind ourselves that we didn't we didn't come out of a box at a store and we didn't come out of a test tube. We evolved within what we call nature along the trees and the frogs and the toadstools. I mean, we are as much a product of the natural world as anything else in the natural world. And I think just as we learn more and more about how other living things don't stand alone, this is true for humans too. So if we look at a flower growing in the field, we know we're not looking at a single organism. We're looking at an ecosystem with billions of microbes in the soil providing services to the flower in exchange for carbon sugars with millions or billions of microbes on the surface of the flower and even inside the leaves that are providing services to the flower. And, And we're really no different. We human beings in the ecosystem of us have many mutualistic relationships with all these microorganisms that live in us and on us and are crucial to all our systems working properly. Every place we go, whether it's from one room in our house to a different city, we're trailing our own signature of microbes and taking in some of the microbial signature around us. And that incredible microbial life is at the heart of what makes nature thrive, and we're, we're part of that. So why in the age of COVID is it important for all of us to have a better understanding of things like bacteria and viruses and the world of microorganisms. You know, one thing I think it's really important that as we continue to understand this invisible world of uh, microorganisms that's in us and around us, not to fear it. I mean, I do worry that fear of COVID is setting off a new embrace of kind of a crazy ultra hygiene, you know, gallons of hand sanitizers and antimicrobial soaps and people not wanting to touch each other, you know, not wanting to shake hands, not wanting to hug. I worry that some of those measures will actually make us less safe if they indiscriminately kill microbes, because often when that happens, only the strongest and most aggressive microorganisms are left. For me, the main lesson that we have to take away from the pandemic is that it's so important to stop the degradation of natural environments that then cause wild populations that carry viruses to interact with humanity. In all these biodiversity hotspots in the tropics, when the demands of the highly developed world, like the U.S. and European countries, when we put demands on those countries for cheap meat or palm oil, people then burn down forests to have agriculture. And that puts a tremendous pressure on those wild populations. They have to have somewhere to go so that then they're in greater contact with human beings. And that kind of environmental disruption, I mean, it's not just dangerous in those biodiversity hotspots in the tropics, you know, it also explains the outbreak of Lyme disease in the northeast of this country. So we really, really have to pay much more attention to the integrity of ecosystems around us and not destroy them. So while reading the the chapter, Transforming Deserts into Wetlands, I couldn't help but think about how many of us believe that if humans created this crisis, it will be humans that will solve it. But you share with us how nature will and does have a lot to say about how we ultimately move forward. So how do we get people to understand the real solution is actually getting nature to help us 
to share in the process, and to be a partner in the solutions. Uh, Yeah, I love that chapter, Transforming Deserts into Wetlands, which is the story of ranchers and scientists and government, people working for government agencies, trying to come together and come up with a solution to the degradation of streams that was going on there that was threatening the local trout population. So I think I, I, have, to, I have to say that the frame around that has to be not just that nature will solve it, but that people have to make a decision to stop putting roadblocks that is diminishing the rest of nature so that nature can step forward and make those changes. I love that chapter for so many reasons. And I think, you know, one of the reasons is that there are, were these people that had to come together who had been at loggerheads in many ways for a long time. So humans tend to have an easier time trusting and working with people who are very similar to them, who look like them, who talk like them, who have similar jobs and similar backgrounds and similar life experiences, who vote like them. And successful groups, whether it's groups that are trying to restore a landscape or do any other thing, have to be committed to trust and openness. So that was one of the reasons that I was so moved about the the story of the ranchers and the scientists and the agency staff. So they were attempting to make very big changes in cattle management in order to restore degraded creeks. And that took a lot of trust and openness. So the first step towards all that was that they, you know, they got together this great big group of people and they sort of thought and looked inside themselves and struggled individually with about what they wanted for the landscape around them. And they all ended up agreeing that what they wanted was a healthy landscape. And then they enlisted the help of a trained facilitator. And I love what she told me about her work. She said, every consensus Based workshop gets emotional at some point. Hell, I cry at all of them. And even when she wasn't there, they continued to do things to build trust within the group. They always sat or tried to sit at a round table so that no one appeared to be the head of the table. When I went to one of their meetings, they had this elaborate, what they called a serpentine greeting at the beginning of every meeting where they would all have to interact and shake hands and exchange pleasantries. So that really formed the base of the, the basis of the human trust that, that was there for that miracle to happen. And then the other part was that they, the ranchers changed their, the way that they moved their cattle around. They were keeping them away from the creeks for a certain period of time. And what happened then was that these degraded creeks, seeds that lived in the soil started to germinate, seeds that drifted in on the wind or seeds that dropped from animals' coats, all these things, all these plants started to grow near the creeks. After a while of this new vegetation starting to grow up, and this is an area where the only thing growing anywhere was sagebrush and rabbit brush, plants that only live in in very low water situations. New vegetation started to grow up and then the beaver arrived and the beaver completely changed this landscape. I mean, the landscape had started to change with the ranchers changing the way the cattle moved, but the beaver came in and they started cutting down some of that new vegetation and they started building their dams and started building their lodges and As they built the dams, the creek started to back up and expand into these pools, and these pools started to leach out into the landscape, and it actually changed the water table in the area. The before and after pictures are just astounding. First, you see these landscapes where there was just this little trickle of water going through, which always dried up in the middle of the summer. A number of years later, with all these changes that the ranchers and and their allies had made, you had wet meadows, you know, vegetation that usually grows in watery areas. The sagebrush had to retreat because there was too much water. The landscapes were just completely different. And it was because when the beaver arrived, ranchers don't typically like beavers, you know, beavers will block up their irrigation system. So ranchers typically would shoot beavers when they saw them. And now these ranchers, you know, view the beavers as their best friend because they have transformed a landscape into one that 
is more fire resistant, that provides more fodder for the cattle. It's beautiful. So do you think that our crisis is going to encourage more of that, of people who view each other with suspicion and hostility can learn to work together? You know, I think that a lot of people are alarmed by what's going on in the world, alarmed by the degradation of the natural. You know, there are people who are having to rebuild communities that have been wiped out by fires. People are having to come together to take some of these steps. But I think I think what's really important is popularizing those stories. And it's not just me who's doing that. Much as I believe in the power of journalists to investigate and tell the truth about what's going on, given the all the pressures on the media to make money and to have a 24-hour presence, there has been a terrible, a terrible surge of disaster journalism, I think, that's been going on for quite a while. And I think what's really promising is that there is a new current of journalism that is gaining strength, and it's called solutions journalism. It is absolutely as valid and as important for people to know about the good things that individuals and communities are doing. Absolutely essential for people to know that in some of these places where the natural world just seemed degraded and hopeless, that people are able to work with the rest of nature and bring those areas back. So I have great hopes that people are hearing about these stories and that people are feeling optimistic about taking some steps to change things. Which leads me to, to the last chapter, living in verdant cities. Can you share with us some of the wonderful stories of some of the cities and how the cities are reacting to this crisis and what cities are doing to make themselves more welcoming to nature? I went to this wonderful, wonderful conference in Paris of this organization called the Nature of Cities, and it brought together visionaries from all over the world talking about efforts in cities everywhere to to be more welcoming of nature, having green roofs on the tops of buildings where they're not only providing a little habitat for insects and birds, but they're also uh, providing a, a tremendous cooling effect, stormwater management effect. Some cities are growing things up the sides of buildings. There's a fabulous building here in Portland, Oregon, like a 15-story building, and they have trellises running up the sides of the building with vines going up those trellises. Cities like Singapore, I mean, Singapore 50 years ago decided to reconceive itself as a what it, what it called uh, was a garden city, and now they're stretching that idea to being a city in nature. So they're just like greening every available surface. So they not only have 350 parks, but 225 miles of park connectors so that people can walk and jog and bike from one park to another, always sort of surrounded by greenery. And they have, you know, 295 acres of green roofs. And what's most amazing to me is that as the population of the city has grown, the percentage of urban greenery has also grown. They're expanding the amount of greenery all the time. And they've also been successful at expanding and increasing the numbers of native species in the city. So Lena Chan is the woman who I met at this conference who is sort of directing a lot of that effort. They call themselves some of these greening cities around the world, biophilic cities, cities with a love of nature. So not only all that increased greenery, but also making sure that at least 50% of the population can name at least 10 native plants and birds and butterflies. Because when you can name something, when you can recognize something, then you can love it and try to take care of it. The effort is not only to put more green growing stuff near us humans because we are healthier when we're exposed to greenery and insects and microorganisms and all the rest of nature. Cities can offer habitat to 
creatures that no longer can find a toehold in some of our really terrible agricultural areas. Cities can do a lot. So there again, kind of talk about how important that idea of mutualism is part of our discussion on the solutions of our climate crisis. Well, it's it's definitely not enough to just stop using fossil fuels. You know, we, we absolutely have to do that, but it's not enough. We have to protect ecosystems and expand them and regenerate the ones that we've destroyed because healthy ecosystems are the key to all of our environmental concerns, whether it's drawing down carbon from the atmosphere to the soil, where it can be safely stored for hundreds of years to keeping water on the land. Key to all those ecosystems functioning well is all that all those mutually beneficial relationships that are thriving there, those ecosystems and the mutualisms that hold them together are key. I have to say that one of the, the most hopeful threads for me in the book was the idea of ecosystem legacies and memories. Some of the forest ecologists that are doing research, one of them was working on some science of restoring an area that had been destroyed by a, a, a mine flood. And she was saying that even when a landscape has been vanquished, you know, whether by fire or flood or mining or some other human encroachment, those landscapes can come back because the land itself, and maybe not right in the middle of the hot spot, the ruined spot, but nearby, the land itself is seeded with bits of biology, bits of DNA, microorganisms, and sometimes seeds that can regenerate those mutualistic relationships that hold the landscape together and bring that place back. So I like to think that that's true for human relationships, too, that we have memories of times when there weren't, wasn't so much mistrust, when there wasn't so much anger, when there wasn't so much fear. And when we work together on things, that is a very fertile field for regeneration, too. So finally... What do you hope your readers will take away with them from your book? I hope that they realize that they can walk out their front door and figure out how to regenerate something, whether it's a spot in their front yard or a parking strip on the sidewalk or whether it's a city park or a, a playground. We have a lot to work on regenerating everything. There are many, many opportunities, and there are a lot of people who really want to do it. So regenerate every spot that we can. Reach out to others. I don't get discouraged when I see when I see degraded landscapes because I've seen so often how people can remove the obstacles for nature to flourish, and those landscapes can come back. But I do get really I do get really frustrated when I walk through like a department store and see the aisles and aisles of useless stuff that really nobody needs and that probably was responsible for some landscape somewhere being burned or dug up or whatever. Regenerate and buy less stuff. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Kristen Olson. If you would like to learn more of her work, please visit kristenolson.com. Nature Revisited would like to thank Kiss the Ground for their sponsorship of this episode. And if you haven't seen the film by that name, we highly recommend it. And if you would like to sponsor an episode of Nature Revisited, please visit our website. If you enjoyed this episode, please share with friends, family, and colleagues. You can follow Nature Revisited on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and on our website, NordenProductions.com. That's Norden, N-O-O-R-D-E-N productions.com. The music is Water of Love by Dire Straits. Nature Revisited is produced by Stefan Van Orden and Charles Gagan. 
and I hope you will join us for our next edition of Nature Revisited. And in the meantime, do remember, we are nature. Nature.